Hi, everyone around the world. Thanks to all of you who have sent messages and e emails in appreciation of my two-part Jerry Wells Peru reports. We left off last week in part one with Jerry after his bride, Kathy, watched him sing the three tones at the Aramu Muguru doorway in Peru, not far from Lake Titicaca. And then Jerry suddenly glowed with light and vanished into the carved rock wall. Tonight, I will continue part two and a video that Jerry produced about how to operate the doorway. But first, there is more news about mystery booms and strange cattle deaths. Last Saturday night at 9.50 p.m. Central Time in Clarksville, Tennessee, between Nashville and Fort Campbell, Kentucky, the 9-11 Emergency Call Center received lots of calls from worried residents reporting that a loud boom shook the ground and their houses. And it ranged from Sango to Old Russellville Pike to Woodlawn Drive near the Cumberland River. And some even reported seeing a flash of light at the same time as the boom. Here is a front door security camera video. Clarksville is a Tennessee town with about 150,000 residents, only about 14 miles southeast of the U.S. Army's Fort Campbell Depot that has the Army's only air assault division. But when local authorities and media checked with Fort Campbell, they learned that because it was the Labor Day holiday, Fort Campbell was quiet without mil military weapon exercises. The Clarksville Police Department told reporters that it spent two hours investigating along with the fire department, the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office, and emergency medical services but they did not find any evidence of an explosive source. After that, the police department issued a press release that said, quote, currently this seems to be some sort of unknown phenomena until someone reports actual damage, close quote, from the Clarksville, Tennessee Police Department press release. If anyone has any more information about this mysterious boom Saturday night, September 4th, a boom that was strong enough to shake houses but did not affect seismometers. Please contact me at earthfiles at earthfiles.com. All requests for anonymity are honored. And again, you can reach me at earthfiles at earthfiles.com. Now, at my news website, Earth Files, from September 5th, 2021, going backwards 10 years in time to January 29th, 2011, I have produced nearly 200 Earth Files reports about mystery booms around the world. And in addition to booms, I have also reported other news about strange metallic sounds or musical trumpet notes in the sky or the awful sound of two metal trains crashing head on, according to witnesses. And yet, investigators do not find any evidence of explosions or crashes. Since mid-August, I have also received three different strange animal death reports. On August 12th, a rancher in Mitchell Canyon, south of Fossil, Oregon, found one of his bulls dead and bloodlessly mutilated. By August 18th of 2021, the Wheeler County Sheriff's Office was reporting in this Facebook that the nose, tongue, left cheek, left ear, left eye, penis, testicles, and part of the tail were removed. I have other photographs, but I'm not showing in this public channel. But you can see and read all of my animal mutilation reports, which are in the hundreds, at the Real X Files section of my earthfiles.com news website. 
many photographs, documents there. Now, Fossil, Oregon is 125 miles southeast of Portland, and this is the 12th bloodless cattle mutilation in the Fossil and Wheeler County region since 2017. And now, only recently on September 1st, was a law enforcement report about the shocking July 29, 2021 discovery in Jamestown, North Dakota, of 58 dead and pregnant cows. These were investigated by the Stutzman County Sheriff's Office in North Dakota. And this is the September 1st, 2021 announcement in the Valley News Live that the Stutzman County Sheriff's Department and the North Dakota Stockman's Association have announced a $40,000 reward, quote, for information leading to the arrest of the person or persons responsible for the mass deaths of the 58 pregnant cows, close quote. This week, I talked with the local deputy brand inspector, Fred Fredrickson, who confirmed first that there were no tissue excisions at all on the 58 pregnant cows, as would be found in the bloodless, trackless animal mutilations reported around the world since the 1960s. So there is a difference. Brand Inspector Fredrickson also told me that a veterinarian's official investigation confirmed that of the 80 surviving alive cows on the Jamestown Ranch, 15 of them aborted their calves after whatever the deathly assault was. So far, what authorities have ruled out as possible causes of all of the pregnant cow deaths are lightning, anthrax, blue-green algae, clostridial disease, lead poisoning, lack of water, and the naturally occurring nitrate toxicity in the land, but all were ruled out as causes of death to these 58 pregnant cows. Now, a third case also found on August 12, 2021, was reported to me by an Earth Files viewer whose friend lives in Agua Caliente, central Mexico, where a mutilated horse was found dead. He sent a color photograph of the dead horse showing the tissue on the left side of its head had been removed down to bone like many other domestic and wild animals since the 1960s. So far, I do not have other details, but I will produce a real X-Files report at myearthfiles.com news website when I have more to report. And now, let's continue with the experiences of Jerry Wills on November 11, 1998 when he vanished into the rock doorway of Aramu Muru, witnessed by his wife, Kathy. Jerry traveled rapidly in what he felt like a bubble, a translucent bubble, from which he could see stars and nebula and ended up in a white glowing room where he could hear a male voice that reminded him of a public address speaker when he was in school. The male voice was trying to explain that the all-white glowing room was in another universe, not the universe that has Earth. The voice tried to explain to Jerry that Earth and our universe, are uh, that the Earth universe is filled with life forms and that this was a great surprise to what he calls the white room intelligences they did not understand what the spark was at the beginning of their experiment to create another test universe, their goal. They did not understand why the new laboratory universe, our universe, kept growing. This is an illustration that Jerry Wills made of the quote, large, black, gelatinous-looking experimental universe being held in place and balanced with the red rods by the lab experimenters in the white room universe. Jerry Wills sketched himself 
as the small male silhouette in the bottom foreground, looking at their experimental universe, our universe from which he had come from Earth, being created by the intelligences in the all-white room, and the voice told Jerry, our Earth universe is their test universe. Here now begins part two with Jerry Wills describing his disappearance into the Aramu Muru rock doorway witnessed by his bride, Kathy, at 11 p.m. local time in Hayumarca, Peru, along the shores of Lake Titicaca, when Jerry was 45 years old. This voice was talking about how they were colliding particles. And somehow a spark had occurred, and the spark didn't go away. Instead, it started growing. And as it grew, it started accumulating and creating more of itself on its own. And I said, like it's a black hole. He laughed. He says, no, no, no. We know what black holes are. It's nothing like that. He says, think of it maybe as a white hole. Think of it as a place where all of creation manifests itself within these torrents of energy that are moving both inward and outward simultaneously. It was really a difficult thing to try and understand. It sounds like he's trying to describe that they were working in a laboratory like a collider and that when the spark began to emerge and kept growing, that they somehow had provoked another universe to come through a black hole on that side through a white hole where they were that was now expanding and they had no control over it. Yeah, that's pretty much. He said it was a spark, a spark of life, and all of these things were being created from that. Well, we talk about a singularity in this universe, the beginning of heat and light from nothing. If there are white holes that are the explosion of matter coming from black holes on the other side of an electromagnetic membrane between universes... It really matches very closely to what he was saying that they accidentally triggered in their experiments. If they were trying to experiment in a lab in another universe, trying to create the conditions in which universes come into being and evolve to settle something that they were trying to explore, then they would have to have set up conditions that would set the rules in whatever universe they were trying to create to test. And it might explain why this universe is like on the edge of a razor blade in terms of the conditions that favor life as opposed to no life. Yeah, they had learned that life had started to populate throughout our universe. That they had made. Yeah, they were fascinated by this curious as can be how this was possible. And this doorway that I had gone through was something that they had put in place. They had these doorways throughout our universe in various places. They had been sending scientists in there to study the universe because this was a whole new realm of science for them to explore. And when they started discovering life in there, well, they were pretty shocked. Apparently, I'm not the only person who'd ever come through that doorway. But the other people that had gone through the doorway had died of shock, I guess. And you didn't die because maybe you're not Homo sapiens sapien? I think I didn't die because I didn't get all that completely freaked out by it. I was up to a point, but when I didn't really think it was real, then I just relaxed and went with it. The shaman, Pedro, in Peru, who had described seeing, I think you said, tall beings coming out of that door? Well, they looked like they were the ancient ones, tall, dressed in period clothing for, say, the Incas or whoever it was. But people that he took as being from that ancient time who were coming through the doorway to check out their land. And apparently these doorways go to other places on this planet, to other planets. So maybe these folks that were coming through had figured out how to direct their travels. 
according to this voice I was talking to, there is a way to direct where you're going. But my only concern at that point was, how do I get back? Okay. Is it possible that the beings that Pedro was referring to as a shaman would be the intelligence in this other universe in which we are nested? The other universe would come through to test their laboratory experiment, creating this universe that surprised them because it was evolving with life in it. Anything that was seen emerging from that doorway that you went through would be from the experimenters in the other universe that encompasses us. I think that that's very possible because, as I mentioned, time is much different there than it is here. And they might have been through and thinking that the Inca or whoever would have succeeded them were dressed in a certain way the last time they were through. So the next time they go through, they dress like that. Their royalty, they can walk around wherever they want to go, and no one's going to give them any grief. But they're not royalty. They're actually scientists from another universe. Yeah, exactly. That voice that I was talking to was telling me that part of their interest was that when they looked outward, things just expanded out and out and out. But there were things that were identical out there as there were the deeper and deeper they looked into the smallest things, that it was always the same. It's the same if it was an atom versus a galaxy. They were trying to understand their place in the universe. What they didn't expect was to find that there was a universe that they were within and that there was a universe that they surrounded. It was quite an astonishing thing to have discovered for them. If they discovered that they were inside of another universe and that they had made a universe that they surrounded, then maybe even an infinite number of universes nest within each other. I think that's what the implication is, that there isn't an upper or lower limit. And what is the relationship now between their universe and this one? Oh, I haven't a clue. I could not understand his definition of time. He told me how to get back. He told me to walk towards this thing. And he says, you're going to lift off of your feet. Don't be afraid. Close your eyes. He says, I want you to focus on your wife. So I started walking towards it. I said goodbye to him. And I started running towards it. It's weird when you're running and you're not touching the floor. You're not really moving. But you're floating towards this thing. And this hissing started. So I took a deep breath, like he suggested, closed my eyes, kind of gritted my teeth, tensed up, and it felt like I moved through a membrane, some resistance or impedance. I opened my eyes. I'm looking around. I can breathe just fine. I focused on Kathy. Eventually, I saw the bead of light that was getting brighter, closer. It was our sun. It wasn't like I went past planets, but there was this moment when I noticed that I was moving towards the dark side of the Earth from the North Pole. I was moving so fast, I thought I was going to die. So I closed my eyes, the hissing got a little louder, and then, just like before, there was nothing, just silence. And I opened my eyes, and I'm kind of crumpled up, sitting on this rock floor. And I look around, and there's the opening for the doorway right in front of me. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> I hit that doorway full on, and it was solid. It was like I was looking through glass. That didn't make sense. There is no glass there. Now I'm getting really anxious about this. I can see Kathy out there. She's holding her face in her hands, and I'm like, oh, my God. I'm feeling all around it, trying to find an edge, a crack, something. Finally, I got the presence of mind to feel for that little notch that you put your forehead into, and I found it. So I got on my knees, put my forehead in there, and I started making those tones again. And the air was very thin. It was hard to breathe. I kept making the tones over and over and over. Finally, I must have hit it just right because I just passed right through it. I backed away from the doorway as fast as I could and fell on the ground laying on my back looking up at the stars. And Kathy goes, you're back. Oh, my God. I said, let's get the hell out of here. She's saying, you glowed and you were gone. 
that I vanished. She said it looked like Star Trek, that I just sort of glowed and faded out. And I said, well, how long was I gone? Well, you were only gone a couple minutes. What happened? How could it have ended up being only two or three minutes in Earth time if it seemed hours to you in his universe? Yeah, I know. The only thing that I can figure is that the means of moving from one point to another was outside the dynamic of time altogether. That these doorways are instantaneous passageways to other places. You know, you can be somewhere for a while, go back through it and arrive just shortly after you left. That there is time travel through these doorways that the other universe created in order to study this universe. Yeah. When it comes to moving through these things, I don't know how time works. You know, it was the same situation when I was talking with Zoe. He was telling me that they could go from where they are to here and that it would be almost instantaneous. There really wasn't any time during the time of travel. Time stopped and then it restarted once you arrived. What are you left with as a residue of that idea that we are in a simulated universe created by someone else? What it's left me with, sense of awe. The thing that I find to be most remarkable is that at least between this universe and that one, there are beings who are aware of themselves and aware of their surroundings. But it is that spark of life that joins us, no matter what universe we're in. I know there's life out there among those stars. Somehow there's a veil. Somehow there's this barrier, this thing that I pass through twice. So this commonality of life, I find that to be awe-inspiring. No matter where you go, there's a spark of intelligence and a spark of life out there. And it can be quite good. That was our original December 2016 interview five years ago. Afterward, Jerry told me that he had people often asking him for the three tones and what to do if they could get to the Aramu Mururi rock doorway to try it out for themselves. So a couple of years ago, not wanting to break a promise on those tones, Jerry did a video at Aramu Muru that he calls How to Operate the Doorway and gave me permission to show you on tonight's Earth Files YouTube broadcast. While I'm not going to give you the three tones, I'm going to show you how this works. What you do is you come over here. This is the doorway. Down below are two places where you can put your knees. Come down like so, and bring the camera a little closer, and you'll see there's a place exactly here for your forehead. Put your hands like so, and even while I'm talking, you can feel a vibration coming out of the stone. Are you comfortable? Put your head here, and you make the three tones. And while you're making the three tones, you'll feel as though Actually, as you're making the first two of the tones, you'll start feeling as though you're in a dream. It feels like you're dreaming that you're falling. For people who are watching, it may look as though you're shimmering with some light or simply that you just vanished. When you use the third tone, that's when you feel a rush. And that rush seems to propel you directly through this somehow and into another place. It's essential that you have a clear idea where you want to arrive to. There are rumors here that there are children who have used this and older folks who have used this and they've simply vanished and they've never been seen again. And that's why this place is called Puerta del Diablo, 
the doorway of the devil. The locals are afraid of this. They have no idea what it is or how it works. All they know is that usually in the middle of the night, if someone is up here playing in this area or messing with this doorway, they may be sitting here as I am now and then just simply vanish in front of their friend's eyes, much in the same way as I did that night in 1998. So that's how the doorway works. Why it works? I believe that this sandstone that it's made of is a very unique type of sandstone. It's prehistoric. It's, um, it's like petrified wood, let's say. And just the very nature of the silica in this sand, in this sandstone, it responds to tone, to external energy being influenced upon it such as making a tone loudly. It would cause your body to resonate as you're making a tone and it would also cause the sandstone, the silica, to start vibrating. And as you know, or if you don't know, when silica vibrates, it releases energy. It's called the piezoelectric effect. This very well may lie upon a ley line. That may be the reason why it was put here and the way that it's been designed, this facing nice and smooth, these two columns on either side that you've seen, that would mean that this is a tuned port. If this is on a ley line, and there's a lot of ifs about this because we don't understand anything about how it works, but if this is on a ley line and you add energy to the energy that's already here, then you've changed the potential and it could be that that potential is opening an interdimensional doorway, a wormhole of sorts. And I believe that that wormhole is something that can actually occur. The field that would surround your body when you go in resonance with this through the tones that you make. And I believe from my own experience that when you make those tones, it's very important that you have a clear understanding of where you want to arrive to. As I've been told, it doesn't matter if it's in the future or the past, or what location on this planet, or anywhere else in the universe. I believe these doorways exist in numerous locations throughout the universe. Knowing where you want to go is vitally important. Well, that's all for now. We'll find out if our intrepid explorers have any luck, and then we'll come back and report on that. I hope they have a great trip. Mine was frightening. And that is how the doorway works. I've got chocolate joining me. You know, the universe is filled with matter. And we don't know why. We know how matter was created and we can even create matter in a lab. But every time we create matter in particle accelerators, we get an equal amount of antimatter. And the perfect kind of lab expectation is that that is what they will get, perfectly balanced antimatter with matter. And then they self-annihilate. If the Big Bang created equal amounts of matter and antimatter, the two would have destroyed each other early on. And that is why this matter universe that we are in is one of the greatest mysteries in cosmology. And according to Jerry Wills, that voice in the white room is as puzzled as we are about why this universe exists with matter and life forms. And I hope that you have been as provoked by this as I have always been in talking with Jerry, who himself will say, I know that this seems so incredible to people, but it really happened. Kathy, in a very short moment of time, saw him glow and disappear and she always has uh, reinforced that she saw that much. And I think that being able 
to look at the current landscape of all of the science papers that have been coming out and articles in Scientific American and the journal that CERN in Geneva puts out about what is happening with the Large Hadron Collider, that this question about why are we in a universe that exists at all when the lab report would su suggest that anything in the effort of trying to be a universe would be self-annihilating before it would preserve. And that makes this universe so extraordinary. And for those of you who might ask, well, the creation of another universe, that's just too much. We're beginning to explore and finally reach that headline that we're not alone in this universe. And we look out through Hubble to three trillion some galaxies in this universe. But many different people who have come from different science walks of life are also now writing papers. There's more and more journals about multiverse, multiple universes, parallel universes, separated in frequencies, dimensions. And this is a whole new, huge uh, landscape of exploration in front of everyone. So if any of you are feeling like, well, this sounds just too far out, start reading Scientific American and some of the wonderful journals that are uh, reporting all of the time and see how many papers are now being released about are we in a holographic universe? Are we in parallel universes? Are there an infinite number of universes? That has been a question in some papers. And the more you read, the more provocative, provoking of thought Jerry Will's experience becomes. And I am grateful that I've been able to talk with him about this amazing journey that he went on and that I hope that if any of you who are in my Earth Files YouTube channel audience have any insight into any part of this from perhaps journeys that you have taken in the abduction syndrome and maybe been ex uh, exposed to something similar to let me know. We are clearly at a time where humans have suppressed so much from each other, politically, personally, anything having to do with abductions has been difficult. And now it feels like amid the pandemic, amid all the uncertainties about the dripping apocalypse that seems to be upon us, is this exciting moment where we could finally break through as a species on Earth to a truth, a fundamental truth. We are not the only intelligent life in this three trillion u galaxy universe and that there may be an infinite number of universe I, some made by intelligences that come from another dimension that can mix and match atoms and molecules so easily. Anyway, I hope you have been excited by the new thoughts that this has brought. And I look forward to hearing your comments and questions. And Ian, what do we have up first? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank all of the generous viewers in the Super Chats this evening. I'm going to run through the list. Moonbird, Eric Hi, Moonbird. Ackley, Courtney C., Drug TV, Adam Ambrose, Stephen Carrier, Linda DeLibo, John Chan, Jeffrey 050711, Mark Anthony, Hello Real Estate, Caroline Boyce, Joan Oishi, and I'd like to say a shout out for Adriana Lino, and also Hannah's in the house tonight. Wow. Thank you, you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I look forward to your feedback uh, on uh, this material. Uh, the one thing that I feel strongly is that we can't not share with each other some of these extraordinary 
experiences of our fellow human beings uh, and be afraid to. And I think that, uh, that all of you who are expressing support, that you are basically saying to me, uh, keep doing what you're doing and I will keep trying for you and for everyone. Thank you so much. What else, Ian? First of all, can we address uh, the issue that several people are mentioning and asking questions about, about the actual voice that Jerry heard? Was it an actual audio voice or did, did he actually have it transplanted telepathically into his head? His and also, also, sorry, one last bit, and, and also the, the fact that it spoke English to him. Thank you. His uh, description, if you will recall, is like a, a voice coming through a loudspeaker that he always thought of uh, when he was in school. I think everybody who's gone to grade school or junior high remembers the speakers uh, with the voice that would come in to, uh, to cause some, something about time or a break or buses or something. So that was the kind of atmosphere of what Jerry described that he was listening to. But when, when you talk about abductees, for example, this is not exactly that, this is going through the rock door in Peru, but you will also, abductee to abductee to abductee, they will tell you that they were communicated by the non-humans in the language in which they lived. And it has been described to me by people who have worked both in the military and the intel side that they know that the rod with the spiral around it that is carved in uh, sandstone and limestone uh, back dated to the time of Samaria and before was defined as a communicator. And I have been told directly that at the meeting on April uh, 20. Uh, 5th, 1964, that at Holloman Air Force Base, that one of the beings that came out of the craft with greys in front of them for this meeting with military and scientists, um, that uh, like a ropey headdress, the, there's a sketch of this uh, in my book, uh, Glimpses of Other Realities, uh, Volume 2, and uh, it's also in the book, uh, UFOs, Past, Present, and Future, by Robert Emenegger and Alan Sandler. And they uh, told me with no uncertainty about it that there was a being that had a ropey headdress uh, with uh, vertical slit eyes, a large nose. It's the sketch has been in the public since the 70s uh, with this black rod with the spiral around it, and that was identified to Alan uh, Sandler uh, and Bob Emenegger as being a communicator that would communicate with the language center of the brain of any human on Earth. And that means that it wouldn't matter. A hundred people speaking a hundred different languages, it would have the ability to interact with everybody in their own language through the brain's language center. What else have we got? Okay, well, Linda, you've actually met up with Jerry yourself. Have you oh, yeah. met up with Jerry's wife and spoken yes. with her as well about oh, her yes. experience? Yes, and I think uh, that the question, yes, I could interview her, but she would say, as she has, well, I was there and then he, he glowed and disappeared. And she was frantic and thought that he came back in a few seconds or minutes. So her, her experience is in a different timeline altogether to what Jerry experienced. But she did witness his glowing and then vanishing and compared it to some of the scenes in Star Trek. So that, I think that's why you don't hear as much from her. If you can imagine, um, she was panicked. She could talk to you about her panic. Linda, what is your own opinion on the doorway in Peru? 
because there are so many articles, because there are so many people, uh, current day and going into the past, uh, the door at that um, particular sandstone butte on Lake Titicaca goes back in uh, carvings and languages and all sorts of, uh, I guess, descriptions that go with the name that has been used there in Peru for centuries. And that uh, Aramumuru means the gate or the door of the gods. And in a strange way, it's the same thing on the Skinwalker Ranch. It's the same thing where uh, there are other places around the world, uh, like Dartmoor maybe in England, where there seems to be a concentration of a certain, and that's the question, what is it that seems to allow things that can appear in dark shapes, do shape shifting, appear as a wolf, appear as a bear, appear as a human, and that the places and the locations are, uh, go back through centuries of human dialogue and why people are very afraid of some places and do not want to go there. So it may be that if we understood the geophysical nature of the earth in relationship to specific frequencies that other intelligences use to access underground bases, portals, uh, all kinds of things that they have the access and ability to do, then we might begin to realize that there are certain parts of the sphere of the earth that are easier for penetration by others from other dimensions, other timelines, other places in this universe, other galaxies, easier portals, so to speak, to go to. And if portal transport throughout this cosmos is what everyone who gets advanced and can move around the universe, that is the only way you can do it. The portals relate to frequency. The idea that you step up to the doorway in Aramumuru and you would have three tones to sing, which is a frequency vibration and that that vibration would be imprinted somehow by the ones who made it, made this doorway, that the frequency would interact with that sandstone, specifically like a key in the door, only instead of a matter, it's frequency, and the frequency releases something in the atomic and molecular structure of the doorway. That is the hypothesis. Uh, and it makes sense uh, in many ways that one area that humans sometimes have maybe underestimated is that the frequencies that we are exposed to in our daily life or frequencies that we emit or frequencies that we are attracted to without even understanding why, that frequencies are a tremendous guidance, and sometimes destruction to the human species. So to me, it all begins to fit together. And remember in the uh, Brains to Galaxies program that I did earlier this year for a couple of conferences, that this young man, Paget, uh, who had been beaten up uh, at a karaoke bar uh, when he was in his early 20s, and when he woke up in the hospital, he no longer could see walls, windows, even people or his family like before. He was seeing patterns of fractals. And to this day, I interviewed him about three or four years ago, and it's at Earth Files, and his description of seeing everything translated into fractals, goes right to the heart of what is now also in Jerry's experience with the voice in the white room saying another 
thing that the white voice test that they had been finding was that from the macro to the micro, there was repetitive patterns and that that would surprise them as much as life emerging in this universe. Well, uh, Jason Paget said that he had become convinced that frequencies are the key to everything from the atom molecule into the macro structure of the universe down to the micro and atomic structure. And that the fractal is a mathematical language. And that if we understood why the universe is the way it is, you would have to go back in the next step to the thought, the thought that dwells in the light that could conceive whole universes, could conceive the impact of certain frequencies to create a cosmos. At least that is the hypothesis of philosophy that there is this mathematical language underlying everything. And to some extent, when uh, David Bohm wrote uh, Wholeness in the Implicate Order back in the 80s, and he has that very important sentence you've heard me talk about before, all mass is frozen light. Well, then you are getting to a fabric that the entire universe and perhaps all universes evolve from one gigantic fabric, which is photon light. And why would then there then be differences in universes and that ever haunting and persistent question? Why in all of this is the dark juxtaposed against the light? And we are going to be getting into more of that in upcoming programs because I am organizing uh, some of your emails and letters on that very subject that are extremely insightful. And I feel like that every week now, we are, this is like a puzzle, and each week there's another puzzle piece, and that eventually we are putting pieces of a puzzle together about the true nature of the universe that we are in and mystified by. Okay, Ian. I've got a comment here from Pamela Jean. She references one of the photographs that was shown, the photograph of the stars that were forming yeah. during the presentation this evening. She says, the photo of the stars that were forming, this is where the aliens that look like humans took me. The sky was not like ours. They had to pull me away from looking up. She also says she spoke telepathically with the beings, but the aliens she also saw in physical form spoke English. And she's given me a lot more information as well. So I'd like to ask her to contact earthfiles at earthfiles.com with more information of her experiences. But I wanted to relay that to you. Well, there are so many people who have not brought their voice to the abduction syndrome because they are afraid. Um, but I'm up to about, I know it's somewhere around uh, 3,000 interviews since uh, 1979. And one of the themes constantly is that if the abductee hears English and or Czechoslovakian or French or whatever, and they feel like that they are in communication like we would be talking with each other face to face before COVID, um, that everything that I know, the non-humans are pretty much exclusively interacting with the human mind through the language centers. That doesn't mean there aren't hybrids that interface with humans and would speak in a language and would speak verbally out loud. But for the most part, and I'd be interested in the abductee you just talked about, if she senses that the communication she's getting in English is inside a voice inside of her head, as opposed to hearing 
uh, audio in her ears. Okay, I want to uh, give another comment. Someone comments here, they said, and this is from Germany, last year I saw a great white glowing football for 15 minutes near Dorsten in Germany, standing motionless in the air. Two days later, I read about a dead horse with cruel wounds in the area. Well, the UFO association with animal mutilations goes back to the early 60s. Uh, the most famous is 1967, September, uh, the horse in the San Luis Valley near Alamosa. That summer, uh, there are newspapers still that you can find in archives that have people reporting these strange uh, aerial objects flying over the San Luis Valley. And the association between the UFOs and animal mutilations was certainly uh, growing and beginning to be publicly discussed by the time that that Appaloosa mare lady was found stripped of flesh from the bottom of the neck up. There was nothing. And the horse, the rest of the horse, looked like it should get up and walk away. It was so fresh. Uh, this is according to a medical doctor from Denver who went there uh, within a short period of time of hearing about this horse, wanted to see for himself. Um, he did not identify himself to any of the media back in 67, but it is Dr. John Altshuler who volunteered to help me in the 80s into the 90s with doing uh, his uh, scientific and hemoglobin and all of the different studies that we did on tissue. He was the medical doctor that was referenced in one of the local newspapers back in 67 that a doctor from Denver had gone to investigate the horse uh, near Alamosa. So now switching over to Dr. John Altshuler telling me in the 80s to the 90s that when he got there, he did not want anybody to know that he was a medical doctor in Denver because he was at the beginning of his career and he did not want to have any negative fallout by an association with UFOs. But he said he uh, looked into the horse's chest and there was not a single organ of consequence. The heart was gone, the lungs were gone, and so forth. But what really hit him as a hematologist and a pathologist, there was, there was no pattern of blood. There was no residue of blood. That the inside of this horse that was stripped of flesh from the neck up, leaving only skeleton to a fresh looking body was that this, to touch I remember him saying, to touch inside, it was dry. It was so dry that it astonished him because the horse had not been dead very long. Well, you jump then to when I was uh, producing a strange harvest in 79 to 80, and I took photographs of various uh, Polaroids and color photos that people in law enforcement had taken from a lot of places. And, had him as a laser specialist uh, back in uh, 1979 to 80. It was really just beginning in a new department in one of the uh, medical uh, centers in Denver. And that's where he worked. And he is the one in my film, A Strange Harvest, who allowed me to bring uh, some uh, chicken breasts, like, uh, like a whole chicken, into a surgery room where he could demonstrate electrocautery, he could demonstrate laser, he demonstrated a scalpel. We timed him on my stopwatch, uh, we ran film. He had the toughest time with a scalpel. He said, you can't do circles and ovals. The skin catches and you end up with little nicks and cuts. The electrocauterizer took forever uh, to make a circle that was even uh, the size of a 50 cent piece. And the laser, which was new at the time, 
we timed it, and as I recall, it took something like three minutes and 19 seconds to make a laser circle, also small, like maybe a 50 cent piece, so that the, the time and the residue that was left from the scalpel, from the electrocauterizer, and from the laser, they had, uh, like, like you would plow a field, there were edges around each of the spirals. It did not look anything like the fresh excisions that have been found on thousands of animals around the world since the 60s, at least the 1960s. So uh, there is a classic example of where the technology in the animal mutilations in which UFOs have, from history, been associated by people saying, I saw this object in the sky over the pasture where the horses were found mutilated, the cattle were found mutilated, the goats, the sheep, the, every domestic animal that you can think of have been subjected to the same bloodless, trackless mutilations. And then when you switch over to wild game, uh, the photographs that I've seen from the U.S. Forestry Department when I was uh, director of special projects at the CBS station in Denver and had a meeting to look at their photos, it was the same ear, eye, tongue, jaw, genitals removed without blood on the wild animals as well. So um, the UFO link to animal mutilations has been a strong link since at least the 1960s and include one of those cartoons that's also in my book, An Alien Harvest, where one of the newspapers uh, in a southern Colorado uh, sheriff's department and the newspaper, there had been so many bloodless, trackless reported mutilations that summer that they did the cartoon of the cow there were cows on the bottom, a beam of light going into a UFO. One of the cows is rising, and the other cows are saying, oh, that's how they do it. So those are the kinds of just folk, uh, the characterization in cartoons that were going on by the time I started working on A Strange Harvest in 1979. And then one more very important uh, firsthand I guess you would say, testimony to me was from uh, Lynn Lauber. He was the director of animal mutilation investigations in Calgary, Canada. And after my film, A Strange Harvest, was first broadcast on May 25, 1980, in that week, I got a phone call from Lynn Lauber in Calgary. And he said, uh, we, I guess they had somebody that was in Colorado who watched the, my broadcast. And then um, probably, uh, I don't know whether it was recorded or, but somehow Lynn Lauber got to see a strange harvest. And he said, his first words, I have no argument with anything that you have reported in your documentary, A Strange Harvest, which was all of the uh, ranchers and law enforcement and people linking UFOs to the animal mutilations, Sheriff Tex Grave saying the perpetrators were creatures from outer space. And that was sort of like, okay, the, the people who are actually involved in the investigations, the people raising animals, the uh, reporters who had been out at night and seeing these UFOs, or at least unidentified spiraling lights and lights that in time lapse would make all kinds of strange patterns in the sky, when what were they above? Pastures. And then in those pastures where reporters and photographers and ranchers and sheriffs and deputies would see these strange lights, sometimes on a nightly basis, the next morning a mutilated animal would be found. That's how tight the association was in some places at some part over the history going from the 60s up to 
to now. So, Ian, I'm at the end of my hour. Is there one more short <laughs> question? Yeah, can we just do a, a couple of, well, some people are mentioning about the strange booms and signs. Has anybody ever tried remote viewing the strange booms and signs around the world? And just a final one on the booms. Do you think that uh, the booms we hear could originate in other dimensions? Because apparently nuclear explosions have the ability to rip into the veil that separates dimensions. That last sentence I resonate with strongly because an airline pilot uh, in when I was working at CNN uh, in 1989 to 1990, and an airline pilot uh, called me having seen a strange harvest and asked if he could meet with me. And it turned into a, a very long, many hours discussion in which he said, one of the most important things that I have learned as a pilot in my debriefings is that not all moving lights are structures in the sky. Some of them are, and this was the quote, tears in the electromagnetic membrane between this dimension and another. And that ties directly to what abductees have heard over the decades it, that boils down to this. You humans do not understand that if you explode a fission bomb, you are tearing into dimensions that you know nothing about. All of this reinforcing Jerry Will's experience in some ways that we have such a myo myopic view of humanity and Earth. We haven't even been allowed to know the big truth that we're not alone in this universe. So we are on a strange psychological game board. And that if we were told the truth, that not only are we one of uncountable numbers of other consciousnesses in this universe, that there could be an infinite number of universes. And therein, I think, is where we have to break through as a civilization. We have to begin to understand some of those bigger truths, to know that our lives, our Earth, our solar system is special, but that we are in a universe that is so large with parallels to other dimensions, timelines, and other universes, and that that is the real truth. So on that note, I'd like to wish all of you uh, the best of health and some joy in this dripping apocalypse. I love you. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select a language or, uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been